Well, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at one of the I am's from John, which is in John 10, 14, where he says, I am the good shepherd and I, I know my own and am known and my own know me. Get that right. I know my own and my own know me. All right. So he knows his sheep and his sheep know him back because he's the good shepherd. And because that was on Father's Day, we're kind of bringing out really how, you know, all of the I am, of the I am's, the good shepherd shows the heart of the father because he cares. He's, he has a tender heart towards the sheep and he goes out to look for the lost sheep and the ones that are cast down. And, you know, he's, that's the heart of the father. Of course, Moses was, was also a shepherd. You know, God basically took him from the school of Egypt and then put it, put him in the school of the shepherd, learning to be a shepherd for 40 years, you know, in the backside of the desert, as it's referred to, but he learned the shepherd's heart, which means he learned the father's heart. And, you know, and so he, he loved his sheep. And we see that like really clearly with Moses, even early on, it, it didn't take years. It was right at the beginning when we can see his father's heart, because there's that one instance where he was literally willing to to give of himself. And that was the story of the, the golden calf, you know, where the Lord is upset. Moses is upset at the sheep, right? Because they've quickly turned and uh, worshiped a golden calf or saying, let's go back to Egypt. And, you know, just a terrible situation. And, and so Moses is deeply concerned about his spiritual children. And so this is what he says to the Lord, Exodus 32 and verse 32. He says, yet now, you know, talking to the Lord, Lord, if you will forgive their sin, good. But if not, I pray blot me out of your book that you've written. That's just something else, isn't it? I mean, there's, that's just hard to comprehend, Right. And, and it doesn't seem like this is like hyperbole on Moses' part that he was exaggerating. I mean, he, he realized Israel had gravely sinned and what he was saying, he's willing to sacrifice his eternity if it would save his sheep. I mean, that's just a father's heart. Now, that's not how the Lord works, <laughs> thankfully. You know, the shepherd can lay down his life for his sheep, but not his eternity unless he doesn't have the heart of a shepherd and he's a hireling, then that's a different story, right? But, you know, God responds in verse 33, he says, you know, Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, him, I will blot him out of my book. All right? And so it, you know, that wasn't an up to Moses for who is, who is in the book and who is not in the book. You know, we just returned from Guatemala and we didn't, little seminar and on heaven and hell. And, you know, I was just kind of got that fresh awareness and preaching on hell, um, and just kind of recounting stories on how serious God takes our life here on earth. You know, just all the scriptures they're they're full of warnings and then just people having different experiences. And, you know, the, especially those Colombian youths, I don't know if you've ever read that, but that Colombian youths, you know, one of the one of the things that they saw that the Lord showed him, they said that one of the worst places in hell is for those who wants to follow God and then turned aside back to sin because they, you know, they rejected Christ, they rejected the light that they saw and chose to go back to darkness. And, you know, that's what God was saying. The one who you know, turns from me as a child of God, like those Israelites were, they saw the deliverance, they got delivered from Egypt. They're a type of a believer, a child of God. And then they say, we're going back, you know? And so the Lord says, the one who sins against me, I'll blot him out of my book. And that just, you know, puts the fear of God in, in our hearts to say, Lord, keep us true. Keep us true to your pathway, to loving you, to letting our love grow cold, 
as has happened to some, but to keep it burning brightly. And so, you know, here Moses is expressing that true heart of a, of a shepherd. He's basically saying, Lord, do whatever it takes to get them into eternity. You know, that was Pastor Bailey's cry too, right? He, he often used to say that he felt like his main ministry was to save the saved, right? Which what meant keep them on the pathway. Because so often the saved can get sidetracked or fall into traps of the enemy. That's something we're bringing out in the, in the message. All the traps of the enemy that can take people to hell, you know, that are very sad, like unforgiveness and, you know, bitterness and, you know, the love of money and all sorts of things can just take people off. But it's, Lord, keep me on your pathway so that I can endure and stand before you and and you'll say, well done, good job, you made it. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And so, you know, that's how we should look to the Lord as our good shepherd. You know, he'll lead us into green pastures besides still waters. He'll restore our soul. But also he wants to give us a new heart, a new heart of flesh. And, you know, even the heart of a shepherd to love others as our shepherd loves. And that's that's kind of what we saw last time with with Moses. You know, I looked at how Moses desired to see the glory of God and and God revealed those five qualities of the heart of the heavenly Father. And well, let's read those verses again in Exodus 34 and verse verses 5 and 6 where the Lord descended on a cloud and he was there with Moses on the mountain and he proclaimed the name of the Lord and the Lord passed before him as proclaiming the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And so we looked previously at, at mercy and graciousness, but now let's look at these other three, that our heavenly father is long suffering. And that is kind of, the meaning is kind of self-evident, right? Is that you're, you're willing to suffer for a really long time. And that was the Lord with Israel. I mean, he just suffered them situation after situation, trial after trial, until finally, I mean, the Lord does have a line, but he's willing to suffer us, suffer for a long time. And finally, at the 10th time, he said to Israel, look, I've, su- I've been long suffering, but every time I give you a chance, you're, you're throwing it back at me. And until he said, 10 times, you've thrown it back to me. Well, for that generation, the Lord said, you're going to perish in the wilderness. And he left it to the next generation. But, you know, it's that idea that long suffering is one of the greatest attributes of the Lord. It is definitely not natural for us. We don't like to suffer for one iota of a moment of a minute. You know, I don't like suffering. I, I, I feel terrible when I get a cold and I'm like, Lord, take this away. <laughs> but you know, even today with events taking place on the earth, we think, Lord, how do you put up with this, this foolishness, this wickedness, this corruption of man and just, and the corrupt mindset of man, Lord, how do you put up with this? But he's long suffering to give opportunity to change and to allow events to take place according to his plan. All right, we can read 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. It's not like the Lord has forgotten or he's like delaying things or just like not paying attention. I mean, that's us. Like we can say and do something, but we drag our feet. It's like, because we don't really want to do it. It's like, didn't, didn't you say you would do that? Yes, I know I did. I said I'd do that. I'd, I'll get to it. That's not the Lord. He doesn't drag his feet. He's not slack. But as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so if God is saying, you know, if from our perspective, he's delaying, we don't want to get upset and start, you know, that, that's when the door opens to, 
mistreating other people. When we get upset or disappointed because of something we want from God, you know, Jesus warned of that in the Sermon on the Mount. But he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. So he has his timetable and we just have to flow with it. You know, and God doesn't want to judge his his creation if there's another way. It's another verse that relates to this in the Old Testament, Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore, will the Lord wait that he may be gracious? He's long suffering so that he can show another of his attributes, graciousness. All right, so sometimes he can't show his graciousness without some long suffering. And if we want to, to show the gracious, graciousness of God, we're going to have to also take on this third attribute, long suffering. God can wait many years and endure a lot of wickedness uh, in someone to give them an opportunity to change. And that means we have to be open to the same thing. And I think the one of the prime examples in Scripture is King Manasseh, right? I mean, aside from the Apostle Paul, that's one of the most amazing conversion stories in the Bible because he was basically the most wicked of all kings. But yet there at the end of his life, after he had turned Judah into pure idolatry so that there was an idol on every street, I mean, the the pressure towards idolatry must have been so great that he just corrupted the whole nation, the temple. But the Lord was long suffering because he knew there was this little window that if he put up with that for, I think it how long did he, was it like 50 years or so or of his reigning or so at, right at the end? Well, it was a little bit before because he, he got converted in, in Babylon and then came back and tried to fix things, but it was too little, too late. But, you know, he humbled himself. That verse is in Second Chronicles 33, verse 12, that when Manasseh was in affliction, he sought the Lord and God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Then verse 13, and Manasseh knew the Lord was God. You know, and so the Lord suffered with Manasseh 50 years because he knew he would eventually turn. That is the long suffering of the Lord. None of us has had to put up with that level <laughs> with anyone like the Lord put up with Manasseh. You know, he's long suffering because he he looks for that opportunity that that willingness to change in that window of course there's a line right because he didn't save every king he put a line for some of those kings like Manasseh's son he he saw the the example of Manasseh and how Manasseh repented and he didn't do it and I forget how long he reigned two years right two years and that was it because he saw the example and he should have followed it himself. You know, the Apostle Paul as, re- as well, he's kind of like the second greatest conversion story, you know, because he he kicked against the pricks of the Holy Spirit. And at that time he was, con- you know, persecuting the church and the people of God. Of course, God used that to spread the gospel, kind of got people out of their comfort zone, out of Jerusalem. And so God used it, but yet, There he was persecuting the people of God, but yet God was long suffering for him because he knew he was his chosen vessel. And Paul testifies of what God did in his life in 1 Timothy 1, verse 16. It says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of to them which should hereafter believe on him to to life everlasting. And so he became a pattern of long suffering to other people because of partly because of the suffering he caused. And so he knew from the Lord, well, I'm called to be a pattern of long suffering. That's my that's my uh quality that I'm gonna of the Lord I'm gonna show it because also because I cause suffering, so I'm gonna endure suffering. But he did that 
unto the glory of God. And so the Lord presents these aspects of himself, his glory, so that we can become like him. And we can take on these aspects of the heart of a father. And I'm sure my dad was long suffering at times because he had to put up with some things, but that's the heart of a father. A father is long suffering. Of course, that's a fruit of the spirit too, to, that God wants to develop in, in each of our hearts. In fact, the Hebrew has an interesting definition of long suffering. It's different than the New Testament in Hebrew. Long-suffering means to have a long nose, right? Basically, to have a big nose. <laughs> That's what long-suffering means. But the the concept that they had was someone with a, a bit with a small nose with small nostrils. They they have to take more breaths, and they're a more passionate person, and they get worked up easily. Whereas someone with a big nose, they take they can take in easy breaths, big long breaths. That was their concept. So basically, someone with the big nose was slow to anger. And that thought of, you know, that was that was a little word. Wow, they have a big nose. They're long-suffering. They don't get worked up that easy. But that that's the heart of God. And that's what that's not just God's nature, it's the nature he's calling us to develop. We could see that in Proverbs, right? Where the admonition to us, Proverbs 16, 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and the, someone who can rule his spirit than those who can take a city. And so that's where the real victory comes. If we can control our spirit and endure, and of course the context here is endure for a long time being slow to react, slow to respond, time after time after time, that's where the victory is. And that's better than if we can conquer a whole city. In fact, that's better if we can conquer a whole empire. Because right? the illustration we can use, you know, one of the greatest generals of all time, Alexander the Great, he could conquer a whole empire. But you know what he did to his best friend? His best friend disagreed with him and made him mad one day and in a terrible fit of rage after he had conquered the known world he had his best friend killed and after that he was he regretted it but that was he couldn't control his spirit so he had his best friend killed and he sorrowed over that till the day he died he had conquered the known world but he couldn't control his spirit you know, and so true strength in life is is the strength within because we've become like the Lord who is long suffering, putting up with all the XYZ <laughs> in people that God puts around us and looking to the Lord and being taken on the heart of a father. All right, we got two more. We better better hurry to get through these. All right. The fourth aspect is good uh, of the of the glory of God is goodness. He's a good God, and you know that's a, a distinction. Actually, a distinction he makes in the last two characteristics. He's abundant in goodness and truth. All right? And so when Moses asked the Lord, "Show me your glory," and God responded, "I'll make my goodness, all of my goodness, to pass before you," and you know, so that so it kind of summarizes the heart of the Father, he's good. And goodness, basically, it means incapable of doing evil to others. And so it's kind of all-encompassing, right? Why am I not going to do something and, you know, take revenge or do something towards other, someone else? Because we're trying to flow in the goodness of God. And he wants us to have, be a reflection of his goodness at not doing evil, you know? And so that's where we need to have a balance of the fear of the Lord. We have to kind of have a reverence and respect for God's ways, careful of his judgments. You know, we don't need to fear the Lord doing something evil to us because he's absolutely incapable of doing evil. He can only do good. 
but that's the same thing we want people to feel around us that, you know, even if they mess up, we're not going to take it out on them and do evil. And so goodness is it, but it's also, it's not just doing what people like, it's doing what's best for them. You know, Romans, here's what Paul says in Romans 2, verse 4, says, Despise thou the riches of his goodness and, and forbearance and long suffering, knowing not, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. You know, it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. And so we can then say for the prodigal son, for him to run out of money and for a family to come just at that time and for him to have no friends and to end up on a farm eating, feeding pigs and being starving enough to wanting to eat the slop. What was that? That was the goodness of God. And because God was good enough to allow him to come to the end of himself, all of a sudden he started thinking back. Boy, in my father's house, even the servants have more than enough to eat. I think I'd rather be a servant <laughs> than in this situation. And all of a sudden, he was ripe for repentance and he was willing to walk in that way. It's the goodness of God. You know, and so God, so often in his goodness, he'll bring situations in our lives that lead us to repentance or to, to change, to transformation, to walk in a better way. You know, goodness is also means to have a separated walk, right? Because goodness is incapable of doing evil and it's incapable of walking in an evil way. So, you know, goodness brings us higher, brings us into a, a holy walk with a holy God. You know, and, you know, God wants our testimony to be one of goodness, no evil. You know, sometimes... The world looks at at Christians, and I don't know if this word is still used in the same way in society, but you know that word prudish, right? Oh, you're just being prudish. Um, it actually comes from a French word meaning modest or respectable. It's like, oh, you're just being modest, right? You're not. You don't want to be like everyone else. Well, to me, that would be a great compliment. Right? You you mean you want to be modest or res- you're calling me modest or respectable? I received that. Right? That should be a test the testimony of believers. Uh, you guys, you're just prudish. You don't you don't want to do have fun. You don't want to do anything that, you know, spoiling our our fun and and so forth. You know that should be our testimony. It, they should look at us and say, you know, they would never do that because they're Christians. In fact. Sarah told me an experience she had in high school, you know, that one of one of her classmates was using bad language in in um what? Elementary school, not even high school. Yeah, elementary school. And uh and so what well someone else said, Hey, stop using that language. She's a Christian. Shouldn't use that around her. You know, they they were aware of her testimony and her Christian walk. She, that's not something she was going to do or walk, you know, she was probably going to leave or <laughs> tell them what, <laughs> what they shouldn't be doing. Right? They knew she didn't want to associate with evil. Right? And so that's something, unfortunately, is not as prevalent today in, in Christian circles. There's a, you know, not that same sense of separation from the ways of the world and evil. And I think God wants to bring us back to that. You know, that separate, even on the outward, you know, Paul, that's what Paul said. First Thessalonians 5, 2, abstain or avoid every appearance of evil. We don't even want to look like we're walking in an evil way or associating with that. And of course, that can have a lot of applications that we won't get into for Christians and so forth. But because we need, we need to get to the last one. Abundant also, the fifth one, abundant in truth, abundant in truth. And of course, that's one of the, the I am's we looked at, right? John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. Now, what's interesting is we're we're looking at this in the in the Old Testament. So, you know, we looked at at the the Greek, and then here's the Hebrew, and the Hebrew definition of truth here it means stability, certainty, trustworthiness, kind of like a pillar. You know, and so God wants us to know something about himself. He's stable. He's reliable. We can, we can trust in him because he's true. And when God says something, we can count on it. We can hang our lives on his word. And, and so the Lord put a lot of importance on the words that he spoke and that he's still speaking. Right? Jesus said those famous words, Luke 16, 17, it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away from the smallest part, the jot or tittle, apostrophe of his word to fail. And so, you know, it's true of what he, of what he has written. It's true of what he speaks to our hearts. You know, so we can safely rest our lives upon what he says and how he's leading us, of course, through wise counsel and confirmation, but we can rest in that. And that's where true safety and freedom comes. You know, we read this parable. It seems like we come back to this parable a lot, the parable of the builder, you know, because that's where stability is. Luke 6, 46, whoever hears my saying and does them, what is he like? The person who built upon the rock. Now, the stability, the promise of stability is endurance of all those external forces coming to move us out of our way. And that, you know, that happens in both the wise and the foolish man. So the promise is you will experience external forces seeking to move you out of the way, seeking to get your, your foot out, out of the pathway, get into one of those traps that take us down. But who are those who will not be moved? It's the ones who hear his sayings, his truth, and they do them. And when they do that, they're purchasing the pr- truth and they're not selling it because they're not moving from it. The st- the. The flood will come, the stream will beat vehemently, but it can't shake it because it's founded upon the rock, upon the word. And so we, let's cry out to God, the God who is abundant in truth, because there's sometimes we need like, Lord, can you give me some abundant truth? I need some abundant word. I need some abundant confirmation so that I can stand in this situation, so that I can endure, so I won't be shaken. And, you know, God wants to do that. He wants to speak to us. He wants to quicken us. I was actually kind of struck, actually this morning, I was just reading what Solomon, you know, when he was building the temple and you know what they call it, what they referred to in the Old Testament for, in the Holy of Holies, they called it the Oracle, the Oracle. Now they use that in heathen terms, you know, they had oracles in the temple. You know, Alexander actually went to the oracle in Egypt and because he wanted to get confirmation of who that he was a god. But you know, they use that word, it's translated that, but it's because God wants us to know we can come to him and he he wants to speak to us. He wants to be an oracle. He wants to guide our lives. He wants to to cause abundant truth to enter into our hearts so that we can stand and having done all to stand in the day of battle when the stream comes and the wind is blowing because he's abundant in truth and he wants to put that abundant truth in us and he wants that to flow through us to be examples you know he wants people to look at our lives and say oh there's a house that stood we can tell we know we've seen the storms and the streams beat against it but he he stood And so many people want to experience the glory of God, want to know the presence of God, want to know revival. But here's the real purpose of it, to put his glory in us, to give us the heart of a shepherd and to have these attributes, these five important attributes. And there's more, 
attributes of the heart of a father, but these five are the ones he shared with Moses. Mercy, goodness, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness. Wait, mercy. I think I wrote that down wrong. Mercy. What was the second one? Mercy. Gracious. Sorry, I wrote it down wrong. (laughs) He's merciful. He's gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Thank you. Sorry, I had a long flight the other day. (laughs) All right. And so these are aspects God wants to develop in his people. That like Moses, he came up to that mountain to see the glory. And God showed him that glory. And that's the glory he wants to put in our lives.